The Royal Navy found itself in competition with the Soviet Navy at this time because the Soviet Navy uh, was starting to build up a very large surface fleet of warships, typified by this Sverdlov class cruiser. The Navy realized that they couldn't uh, match the Soviet Navy on a ship to ship basis. It would have been far too expensive. So they decided uh, to do it by air. And uh, they issued uh, NA Naval Aircraft 39 requirement, which Blackburns uh, won. Uh, and here you can see on Aeroplane Magazine uh, from 1958, the first prototype, uh, Blackburn NA 39, subsequently named Buccaneer. It was powered by uh, two Jaron Jr. engines made by the de Havilland Engine Company. Uh, these were a bit of a political engine. They weren't very reliable and they were barely powerful enough to uh, move this uh, large strike attack aircraft uh, off aircraft carriers with a de decent load. But more of that in a minute or two. I arrived at Royal Naval Air Station Lossiemouth after a short tour in Germany on the Canberra to find myself uh, with three other Royal Air Force officers and four Royal Naval officers uh, on our Buccaneer conversion course. It's interesting to know that Robin Cox here, uh, when he finally left the Navy, had a very distinguished career uh, in the airline business, ending up as uh, one of the chief pilots on Virgin on their A340 fleet. Uh, our course uh, uh, senior officer, Rory Nielsen, another delightful generalist naval officer, identifiable by his handkerchief in his top left-hand pocket, uh, was sadly killed on the crest of run. Uh, my observer, Bodger Reardon, now sadly no longer with us, spent most of his years after leaving the Royal Navy on the Costa uh, del Sol, where the Spanish extradition arrangements with the UK were a li little bit lax. Um, Norman Robeson here, the Royal, Navy, uh, the Royal Air Force navigator, flying officer, newly commissioned, had been a sergeant nav uh, down at uh, Garlingkirchen on the Canberra. Tim Cockrell, uh, also a flying officer at that time, uh, ended up the Air Force, uh, leaving the Air Force as a group captain. That's me there. Uh, John Bennett, uh, short service commission observer. And Barry Titchen, another RAF navigator. So quite a cosmopolitan bunch. On 736 Naval Air Squadron, why won't it go forwards? Come on. We have a snag. My help. Uh, excuse me, folks. I can't get the next slide up. Why doesn't it want to move forward? Okay. It's got stuck. Hmm. Oh, did, ah, it's worked. Let me just describe the Buccaneer quickly. Uh, starting right at the front, uh, there was a powerful radar. Uh, very similar to the Lightning's radar, made by the same company, uh, but optimized for the uh, surface search of maritime targets. From high level, uh, it could give you a range of about 250 miles. Um, designed to be locked onto uh, radar discrete targets, such as a warship, and it would then provide steering and information to the head-up display and uh, range information to the weapon aiming computer. Uh, the aircraft had uh, two, a pilot and an observer under a nice single-piece canopy, excellent visibility, um, twin engines either side, uh, a Coke bottle fuselage that you can see there designed to optimize the area rule, uh, an arrestor hook, vital piece of kit, of course, for carrier operations housed here at the back. The whole of the rear of the fuselage opened up to form a very powerful air brake. Uh, Blackburns decided that they would go for a high tail uh, configuration in order to avoid uh, downwash from the wing uh, during catapult launch and uh, arrested landing. 
on the wing, uh, the inner section of the wing that you can see here uh, was non-folding and the outer section was a folding wing. Uh, there were small flaps on the inner section of the wing here and a full span aileron uh, on the folding section of the wing. Uh, high pressure air was blown through the leading edge of the wing and along the uh, front of the flap and the drooped ailerons to provide additional lift and convince the airplane that it was actually flying faster than it really was. So this reduced our approach speed from around 165 knots down to 125 knots. So a very effective way of allowing the aircraft to fly slowly enough to land on board an aircraft carrier. Uh, however, when the ailerons would droop through 25 degrees, it produced a very powerful nose down pitching moment. So the tailplane at the back here, not only was it blown underneath, but there was an electrically operated flap at the back here, which moved upwards through the same amount as the ailerons moved downwards, thereby counteracting the trim change. Uh, there was a weapons bay with a rotating door, which uh, the bombs were attached to, and this would rotate through 180 degrees uh, in order to expose the weapons. And under the wings, there were four weapon pylons, uh, which allowed uh, extra stores to be carried. There's a photograph of a Mark I Buccaneer airborne from Lossy Mouth. By 1966, when I did the conversion course, the Mark I had been virtually relegated to a second line training role because its unreliable and not very powerful engines had been replaced uh, in the Mark II Buccaneer by the uh, Rolls-Royce Spey, which had considerably more thrust, was much more economical, so it really turned the aeroplane into a much more viable machine. Uh, the cockpit uh, used the integrated flight instrument system, which you can see here, uh, similar to that fitted to the Lightning. Uh, it was originally designed to be used by all RAF fast jet aircraft, uh, would have included the TSR-2 and the Hawker P-1154 had they ever reached production. The cockpit is a little bit of a mess. As you can see, there are lots of bits and pieces which have been tacked on almost as an afterthought. Uh, this simply recognizes the fact that over the years, uh, there were uh, lots of modifications incorporated into this airplane but the main instrument pack was, was very good. We had no dual control airplane. Uh, it was a single pilot machine. The Navy never wasted money building dual control versions of their, their frontline aircraft. So our dual airplane was the good old Hawker Hunter, here seen in its uh, two seat format. And the Hunter, which we had, had the Buccaneers flight instruments uh, installed in front of the left hand pilot. So you could get an idea of uh, what sort of a pilot you were getting if you were an instructor on the conversion unit. But more about how we converted pilots to fly a little bit later. During the course, we were sent down to Bedford, just up the road from here, which had the famous static steam catapult, uh, which was originally used for trials of naval aircraft. And here you can see the very last time it was being used uh, to train the last Royal Navy pilot on the art of the hands-off launch. And I'll go through this in a little bit more detail. Here you can see an airplane about to be launched. It's tensioned up into the flying attitude. So it's resting on this retractable tail skid at the back here, which comes up when the wheels comes up. The catapult strop has been moved forward to tip the aircraft up into that nose up attitude. So it's ready to climb away when it leaves the end of the catapult. It's being restrained, held back by this holdback mechanism here, which will break uh, when the catapult is fired. It was designed to hold the aeroplane with full power applied, but then when the catapult was fired, it would break, fall back onto the deck, thereby releasing the aeroplane. Uh, the flap and droop has been extended to its maximum amount, and you can see the little tailplane flap here. And the boundary layer control system has been uh, is supplying all that uh, high pressure air to the top surfaces of the wings and the underneath of the tailplane. Under the direction of the flight deck officer, who you can see here, who's waving his green flag vigorously, the pilot 
has applied full power. When the engine stabilizes at full power, he will check that everything is okay in the cockpit. He will uh, brace his left hand behind the throttles, put his head back into the headrest of the ejection seat and place his right hand with its nice white uh, chamois lever flying glove clearly in the view of the flight deck officer. The flight deck officer will then uh, look forwards to make sure there's nothing in the way and then he will drop his green flag down. Uh, there will be a pause of about two to three seconds and the catapult will fire and off you go. At Bedford, you ran off the end of it onto a runway at the end of that runway was a rather sort of optimistic tennis night affair in case you didn't get enough push out of the catapult. You always got a hell of a push off the Bedford catapult because there was, generally speaking, no self-generated headwind. The flight deck officer also had a red flag. And if you wish to cancel the launch for some reason or other, you'd shake your head vigorously uh, so that he could see that. He would then lower the green flag and raise the other flag that he held behind his back, which was a red flag. And once the red flag was up in the cockpit, you were clear to throttle back and have the problem sorted out. But you never throttled back until you were absolutely sure that he was waving the red flag. The other unusual thing that we as RAF people on the course had to do was to do deck landing practice. Uh, we never actually arrested uh, when we did deck landing practice on the course. And here you can see an aeroplane doing a low go round uh, on actually HMS Victorious. I, I put that picture on deliberately to show how close to the active runway the personnel operating the ship were. There is a flight deck officer with FDO written on his back there. And he's right on the edge of the active runway. The flight deck was a very dangerous place to work as we shall see in one or two pictures coming up in the future. Having done the course, I was dispatched out by Transport Command Britannia, which took about five days to get to Singapore, to Changi, so no problem with jet lag. And uh, I joined HMS Victorious and 801 Naval Air Squadron in December 1966. HMS Victorious had been launched uh, just before the outbreak of the Second World War, had served uh, in almost every theatre of the Second World War, including uh, the attacks on the Bismarck, uh, Operation Pedestal in the Mediterranean. She'd been hit by kamikazes out in the Far East. And in the 1950s, she was brought into the dockyard to have all the new modifications to enable her to operate modern fast jets. Uh, the angled flight deck, the steam catapult, the enhanced cat uh, rest gear, and this extraordinary three-dimensional air defense radar uh, in that big searchlight uh, type radar on top of the island. So there she is actually in Hong Kong Harbor uh, waiting. Uh, I'm probably going ashore for a few beers having taken the photograph. Uh, let's just have a look at the layout of an aircraft carrier. And this is HMS Victorious in 1966, 67. Okay, she's not terribly big compared to that one that's just been in the Solent, the uh, Gerald R. Ford, but basically uh, the layout is the same. Starting at the bow, you've got two steam catapults. Uh, there's the forward lift, uh, which gives access to the aircraft hangar. There are two jet blast defectors which come up uh, when the catapult is, when the aircraft is running up on the catapult, one there, and that's that one there is retracted. The serviceable aircraft waiting to be launched are spotted, as we call it, on the angled flight deck. The un this, in this picture, obviously, the left-hand catapult is probably unserviceable because you've got some aircraft parked there. An overhead view uh, will show what the flight deck looked like from above. As you can see, it's not terribly big. The landing area was this area here where there were four arrestor wires. You had a projector site here, which gave you your glide slope information. And the center line of the deck is very prominently marked in fluorescent red paint edged with white marks because it was vital uh, to land right in the middle. If you didn't land in the middle, you could either fall over the side on the left 
or run into some other very expensive equipment on your right. Right at the stern, there is another lift down to the uh, aircraft hangar. And in this little triangular area here, uh, you'd often find a helicopter parked uh, just to make your final approach a little bit more interesting. So that's what the ship looked like. Let's run through the sequence of operations then for getting airborne. Uh, here we are with the aircraft uh, spotted on the angle, uh, awaiting uh, their crew. They would be lashed with chains. A normal walk round wouldn't really be possible because you couldn't get to the back of the airplane because it's sticking out over the ocean. Uh, you would man up your aircraft, uh, start up, uh, and when you were ready to taxi, you'd fold the wings, which was an indication uh, to all the flight deck handlers that they could now take the lashing chains off and you were ready to taxi. Bear in mind that the uh, marshalling signals on board a ship were not advisory as they were on the airfield, they were mandatory. And I remember before embarking for the first time being told that if the marshallers taxied you over the side, it was their fault, not yours. The next slide shows uh, aircraft ready to taxi, but uh, the flight deck tractor there, which was another vital piece of kit, that weighed more than the aeroplane. And uh, it was absolutely encased in heavy lead, uh, because if you wanted to move an aeroplane around on the flight deck and the ship was pitching and rolling, you did not want the aeroplane to take control of the tractor. You wanted the tractor to maintain control of the aircraft. So now, there we have two buccaneers on the catapult. The left-hand one is going to be launched first. Right at the back, you can see one of the ground crew uh, attaching the whole mechanism to the little slot in the deck. Uh, this chap here is obviously uh, marshalling uh, the next aircraft, which is out of view behind us. You can see the drooped ailerons very clearly, the main plane flap down at its maximum extension, and the tail plane flap here. Uh, there is a white mark on the fin there because it was vital to set the correct tailplane angle to give you the necessary angle of climb. Uh, the airplane was very pitch sensitive at low speed and high angle of attack. So uh, the whole launch, as I say, was hands off. But if you didn't have the tailplane angle set correctly, that, that could have been fairly unpleasant. So having set the tailplane angle, there was another one of these white jerkin chaps who had a, a a board with they'd go and look at it and show you the angle that that it was set to you would then compare that to what was on your tailplane position indicator in the cockpit and uh, hopefully it would all match up if it didn't match up you had to fiddle around until you got what he showed you outside in correct uh, correct to what you'd calculated Right, next picture shows the left-hand buccaneer accelerating down the catapult, naught to about 130 knots in 145 feet. So very impressive acceleration. And as you went off the end of the ship, the strop which had launched you would fall into the water. And as you flew away, you very, very carefully took control of the aircraft Remember, it was very sensitive in pitch. You did not want to try and introduce a, uh, a, a nose-up pitch. Uh, as the aircraft accelerated, you then retract the landing gear and the flap and droop in stages until you're fully clean and off in your element. So what did we do while we were airborne? Well, we had a pretty good array of weapons available to us in those days. Bear in mind, there were no precision guided weapons uh, such as you have today at all. So all these are pretty much um, dumb weapons. Our, our principal armament for uh, sinking ships were eight 1,000 pound bombs. High explosive, four could be carried on the door and four could be carried under the wings. We also had the British tactical nuclear weapon, Red Beard. One of those would fit inside the bomb door. And, and that, of course, was the sort of ultimate solution to getting rid of a Sverdlov cruiser. We could also uh, carry four of these canisters, each of which had 36 two-inch rocket projectiles in them. So a total of 144 
rocket projectiles. These bigger ones, these good old fashioned three inch rockets were actually night illuminants, which you use to illuminate your target at night by pitching the aircraft up into a 30 degree climb, firing off these rockets, which were called glow worms, which hopefully would deploy a flare on the end of a parachute for you to identify your target. You then come racing around the corner in the dark to carry out a dive bombing or rocket projectile attack on the luckless target below. Very hairy stuff. We could also fit in the bomb door a photographic reconnaissance pack and a photo flash pack. So we had a good capability as a recce aircraft. We could carry four of these bullpup missiles, which were very primitive American missiles uh, designed uh, for uh, specific uh, high value targets. They were controlled through a command to, radio, to line of sight link. You not only had to fly your buccaneer, but you also had to fly the missile uh, manually once you'd launched it. Uh, it was a very difficult uh, combination of things to do. Um, it, it, the Americans used them a lot in Vietnam. The Royal Navy had them, but they weren't particularly effective. You could also put two underwing fuel tanks under the inner wing stations. You could also carry an air to air fueling pod so you could turn your airplane into a tanker, which was a very important thing to be able to do on board. And finally, because we had no internal starter, we could strap a pollution air starter onto one of the wing pylons. So if we diverted ashore, we would send an airplane ashore with one of these on the <laughs> wing pylon so we could start him up and come back again. The aircraft had a fixed air to air refueling probe, so we were well capable of uh, doing tanking. Most of the flying in the Far East was carried out over Malaysia, Borneo, and the Philippines. Uh, we did the usual sort of forward air control work with our army friends ashore, and we had a, uh, a carrier borne ground liaison team of army officers. Uh, weapon delivery, uh, here you can see a buccaneer delivering eight 1,000 pound bombs all at once onto a Salisbury plane. I think this is actually me uh, as it, on an exercise um, in a shallow dive with an automatic release from the weapon system. And it was a pretty accurate uh, form of attack, but even in the 60s, getting fairly vulnerable. Rocket projectiles had to be fired again in a 10 degree dive. Um, same problems occurred, but uh, we used to call it short range dart throwing and it was great fun. Uh, firing all 144 all at once was a truly impressive procedure. And of course, for a nuclear delivery, uh, we would do a toss attack whereby you would run in at uh, about 100 feet and 550 knots. Uh, with the weapon system locked onto your target, uh, you would then get a pull-up program in your head-up display. You'd pitch the aircraft up at about three and a half to four G at about three and a half miles from the target. And at about 30 to 40 degrees nose up, the bomb, which you can see was a pretty big piece of kit, would be released. Uh, it would fly forwards. You would carry out an escape maneuver. Uh, away and uh, it was a remarkably accurate form of attack because I joined 801 squadron having already been based in Germany on a nuclear capable squadron I was immediately made one of the strike crews and I did have the opportunity to deliver a nuclear weapon shape uh, while we were operating out in the Philippines um, against one of the targets which the Chinese have now turned into a major uh, air base on the Spratly Islands and uh, this giant bomb, which left the aircraft with an enormous thump, uh, actually hit the target almost dead in the middle. Very impressive. We also used to carry out quite a lot of flying in conjunction with the US Navy, who were uh, based at a place called Subic Bay in the Philippines. And they were always had about two aircraft carriers on station uh, off Vietnam. And uh, here's one of our aircraft uh, tanking from an A3 Sky Warrior. Uh, we used to carry out uh, simulated attack profiles against uh, our group of naval warships. Is quite a nice picture of a buccaneer with its own personal condensation cloud approaching at high speed. But of course, at the end of the day, it was time to get back on board. Uh, there you can see the landing area. Not very big. There were four arrestoirs here, 
one, two, three, four. And the target wire was number three wire. That is the projector site there, which gave you your glide slope, about four degrees, somewhat steeper than the normal uh, airfield approach. The prominently marked center line and lots of expensive pieces of kit, very, very close to the edge of the flight deck. The plane guard helicopter, where there was a diver fully equipped sitting in the door, such that if an aircraft broke a wire, went over the side, fell into the water, the diver could be deployed very quickly to assist in getting the crew out. If for some reason you couldn't get your hook down or you had a hydraulic failure, uh, this rather sort of optimistic tennis net affair could be erected to catch you as you arrived. Uh, I only ever saw it uh, put up for practice. I never saw it actually used in anger. So joining the landing pattern, uh, this was the always the highest stress of any sortie on board, was getting back on board. Launch was pretty straightforward. It either worked or it didn't. But getting back on board was entirely in your hands. Uh, there you can see an aeroplane uh, joining the landing pattern, uh, fully configured uh, with the hook down, all the aileron droop down, the main plane flap down as well with the boundary layer control system on. You did not rush back into the circuit at high speed. You joined in a fairly leisurely fashion uh, to do the visual circuit, which was always, always a left-hand circuit. And here you can see the briefing guide, which I was given for the very first time in 1966, the first time I went to do that landing practice. The days of PowerPoint presentations and all that sort of stuff were far off in the future. There's a picture of an aircraft on final approach. As you can see, the air brake is fully deployed because you needed the engines up at a high power setting to provide enough uh, thrust and boundary layer control air to convince the wing that although you were only doing 125 knots, you weren't going to stall. Uh, the airplane was actually a very good airplane for deck landing. It was stable. Once you got used to the fact that the ailerons, when drooped, gave you a lot of adverse aileron yaw when you tried to roll into a turn. So you had to use your rudder pedals as well, uh, which most fast jet pilots had forgotten how to do. Um, it was an easy airplane to fly around the circuit. It worked well but you had to be careful. Uh, the traditional way of pointing the airplane with the control column to where you wanted to land and adjusting the speed with the power, which is what I think most people tend to do, simply did not work. It was the other way around. You had to control the aircraft speed with your control column. And we had a, an AOA system, angle of attack system, which gave you the optimum angle of attack for your approach. And it was an audio system. So if you were flying too fast, you would get in your headphones a sort of high pitched bleeping sound, which sounded a bit like this beep, 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 beep. As you slowed the airplane down and increased the angle of attack to the optimum speed for your final approach, those high pitched beeps would morph into a 20 cycle steady tone beep and then if you got too slow too much angle of attack it would go burp 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 and it was very good as a head up display of your speed so with small power changes uh, from the left hand that controlled your glide slope so it was completely 180 degree out to what most people had done before on airfields but once you got the technique it worked very well that's what it looked like on finals. Uh, this is a photograph taken from the recce pack, hence the nose wheels in the way. Um, if you look to the left, you can see the projector site, and it's not a terribly good photograph, I know, but you can just see the little white spot, which was the meatball, and it's slightly below the two green datum lines, because of course the camera is quite a long way below the pilot's eye line. So he's actually on the glide slope. And as you can see, that's a pretty short runway to land on. It's certainly not like 2-8 left at Heathrow, that's for sure. You looked at the center line and the glide slope. You ignored the ship's upper works and anything else because it was simply too distracting. So your whole point was to land down the middle on speed on glide slope. 
no flare. There's an aircraft nicely positioned to take number three target wire. And there he is. Actually, that's another aeroplane at a different time. He's landed a bit short. We all got marked for our landings every time. And uh, there was a sort of public board which put all your marks down. He would have got probably a yellow mark for that, not a green, because he's landed a bit short. Way behind in the wake, you can see a splash uh, sticking up. That was the splash target that was towed by the ship, because a lot of the time, if we couldn't get on air weapons ranges on the mainland, the ship would tow the target and we'd carry out our weaponry uh, literally just behind the ship, which of course all the troops thought was absolutely brilliant. As I said, the flight deck was a dangerous place to operate. As soon as you caught a wire, uh, the troops would rush out in front of you to indicate to fold the wings, put the hook up and taxi as fast as you can off uh, into the parking area. Well, this is me landing in April 1967. Uh, I'd been to the range with my bullpup missiles and unfortunately, uh, one of them uh, I couldn't fire because the range became foul. So I came back on board and landed on. And uh, the first thing I noticed was an enormous splash in front of the ship. And uh, I, hadn't, I had no idea what had actually happened. And over the radio came a peremptory call saying, pilot of 230 to Flyco immediately. And I thought, oh dear, what have I done? And I could see that the ground crew were now picking themselves up off the flight deck and signaling me to taxi clear. And when I got up into Flyco, I was told, I was accused of having fired off my missile. Well, of course, again, this was before the days of instant uh, video recording. Every landing was recorded with uh, a film, uh, the film camera. And while they were developing the film, I felt distinctly uncomfortable because uh, I thought I was going to be in the poo. But when the film came out, as you can see from the uh, shots here, there is no telltale exhaust plume from the missile. It had just fallen off. It bounced over the flight deck handling crew, bounced over the aircraft at the front of the ship that were parked and landed with a splash in the water ahead. From that day onwards, we were not allowed to come back on board with any heavy ordnance under the wings. Other aircraft on board included the Sea Vixen fighter, but this airplane was probably the most popular. It was the carrier onboard delivery Gannett. And whenever the ship was in range, of a suitable airfield, the good old cod gannet would be fired off to go and collect the mail, uh, the newspapers, uh, any films that were going to be shown in the wardroom that night. So it was a popular airplane because it kept us vaguely in touch with the rest of the world. Bear in mind, there were no mobile phones. There was no way of communicating with anybody else other than those who were on board ship. If in the dire emergency you needed to contact home, you were allowed to make a radio call on the uh, medium frequency maritime net, but this was really hardly ever granted. So the Cod Gannet was a very important asset. We didn't only launch airplanes. Here's a Ford Consul, which a luckless midshipman had bought in Hong Kong and uh, discovered that when he got to Singapore, it, it cost him more in import duty than he'd pay for it. So he left it on the ship and uh, it was found in the hangar and uh, it was consigned to the bottom of the Indian Ocean. Uh, I don't think we'd have been allowed to do that these days, but I'm told it reached at least 100 knots at the end of its run, probably the fastest that it had ever been. We had a large group of warships which accompanied us. This is HMS Ain, uh, an air defense ship. You can see the big 965 radar on its main mast. And uh, right at the stern, you can see the SeaCat missile battery. Uh, this is simply just one of the ships which accompanied us all the time as part of the carrier air group. The Navy were past hands at razzing or refueling at sea. Here you can see what was called a liquids raz going on, replenishing the ships, furnished fuel oil, aviation fuel, and any other things like that that had to be done. And probably on the other side of the ship would be a solid stores replenishment ship. And outside of those two store ships, you'd probably find a couple of frigates doing the same thing. So five ships all in close formation, uh, replenishing at sea. This photograph's interesting because it shows the flight deck in Hong Kong. 
I can remember going ashore in Hong Kong one night when we were there uh, for a few days and waking up next morning in my cabin with this terrible hammering going on in my uh, all around me. And I thought, God, I didn't realize I'd had that much to drink the night before. I think I'll just go up on the flight deck to uh, have a breath of fresh air. And when I got up there, this is what I saw. Hundreds and hundreds of Chinamen, uh, each equipped with a dustpan and brush, a hammer and a chisel. And they were by hand chipping all the paint off the flight deck. Now, that's a, a monumental task. In the five days that we were there, they chipped all the paint off the flight deck and repainted it with the uh, high uh, viscosity type special paint uh, to make sure uh, that we didn't slip off the deck. Not only did they repaint the whole of the top of the carrier, but there was a party going round the side of the ship in sampans painting uh, the gray on the side of the hull. Uh, this was the infamous Jenny's side party run by a fearsome uh, matron from China, Jenny. Uh, and she painted every Navy warship that ever called in Hong Kong. And I'm pleased to say that she was still alive in 1997 when we uh, handed the colony over uh, to the Chinese communists. But before we left, she was awarded uh, the OBE, which I thought was a, a wonderful gesture. We did have a bit of spare time uh, when the ship was on passage at sea. As you can see, people used to take the opportunity out there in the tropics to get a little bit of sunshine. And there was also the uh, fearsome game of deck hockey, which could be uh, pretty lethal, especially if you fell over onto that deck, which was um, guaranteed to uh, make a nasty mess of your knees. And there was also the permanent hazard of uh, following the chuck and falling over the side. Uh, there was no internet, there were no mobile phones, so we had to make our own entertainment. Here's a group of, uh, of aviators down in the cabin flat uh, having a little bit of a jam session. Uh, we used to visit places like Pulau Langkawi, which was in those days just a bay off the edge of Malaya, nothing there at all, uh, for a little bit of uh, swimming off the beach uh, and uh, a few barbecues. Today, that's a major tourist attraction. There's the British Far East Fleet, 1967, anchored off Langkawi. Every now and again, the ship would have to go into Singapore dockyard for some maintenance. And uh, this next few pictures shows a group of us uh, borrowing a Royal Navy Morris J2 and driving to Thailand before the backpackers had got there. This magnificent railway engine was powered by teak logs and it had a wonderful brass plaque on it, made in Glasgow, 1895. Uh, they still used elephants to pull logs out of the jungle. And as you can see, there are no backpackers there in the local town of Phuket, which I believe is now a major tourist destination. But eventually it came time to return to the UK. Here we are uh, leaving Singapore on, uh, with our paying off pennant flying, supported by two Met balloons. Uh, and uh, Procedure Alpha, whereby the whole ship's company, not involved in actually driving the ship uh, in their best uniform, is lined up along the sides. And right at the bow are the officers. And uh, I once asked a chief petty officer, why, why is it that the officers go and sit, have to stand right at the front? Well, sir, he said, well, sir, he said, if we run into something, it's you buggers will fall in the sea first. Um, but there we go. Uh, we went to Aden, where we operated for quite a few days. All we got given whilst flying over the potentially hostile uh, land of Aden was this Gulichit RAF air crew on operations. And uh, as you can see inside, I've still got it at home. Uh, you've got on the left-hand side the uh, way to pronounce it, and on the right, what it is that you're trying to say. I particularly like the one right at the bottom, which says, take me to the political officer and the government will give you a large reward. Uh, we operated off Aden in company with HMS Hermes, who was replacing us in the Far East. And uh, on our final day of flying operations, it was decided that the two ships would work closely together Here's a photograph taken from Victorious looking over towards Hermes, similarly equipped to us with Buccaneers and Sea Vixens. We launched uh, both aircraft carriers' air wings and uh, joined up with the hunters from Aden on this enormous 
55 aircraft close formation fly past, which flew round over the Aden Protectorate for a few goes and over Cormaxa to impress the locals uh, not to mess with the British while we withdrew from Aden during the rest of 1967. I am uh, in that second group of buccaneers on the uh, right-hand side of the formation. And there are the hunters all at the back. When it came time to recover to the two ships, the Navy decided they would fly or sail the two ships in line abreast. And of course, they forgot that the angle on HMS Victorious was somewhat different to the angle on HMS Hermes. And HMS Hermes didn't have such an acute angle. So as the two ships sailed parallel like this and the aircraft went to join their landing patterns, HMS Hermes gradually got closer and closer to Victorious. And eventually the circuits were a complete shambles and uh, one luckless sea vixen pilot from Victorious ended up landing on Hermes by mistake. It was rapidly moved forward to the catapult and fired off without so much as a buy or leave. It was rare to have two aircraft carriers operating together, but at least you can see uh, everybody's airborne in this picture. Both flight decks are completely empty. We then came back through the Suez Canal. Uh, you can probably just make out in that photograph a sort of thing that looks vaguely like an old fashioned TV aerial up at the front of the ship, which was a sort of sighting system to keep the ship uh, in the middle of the canal. Uh, perhaps the Ever Given could have done with one of those 18 months ago when it ran into the side of the canal. Uh, there we are going up through the Suez Canal. We all had to be in our best uniform and we had to put as many aircraft as we could up on the flight deck. This was one of the rules of uh, transiting the canal in a warship. Uh, it was an interesting time. Uh, the Israelis were about to go to war for the Six Day War. Um, there are some naval officers looking at the Russian photographers who lined the sides of the Suez Canal, taking pictures of us, and we took pictures of them. On the left there, you can see one of our gannets uh, with the early warning radar in the big bulge underneath it. Uh, that was an essential component uh, of the carrier air group. Uh, because we'd launched the gannets, uh, they would climb up to about 15,000 feet, cruise around about 100 miles away from the ship, and the radar picture, which they generated, could be transmitted on an HF radio link direct into the ops rooms on board the ship, and it, so it gave vital early warning of any incoming threat by air. It's intriguing that today, all those years later, on our two incredibly expensive aircraft carriers, we don't have either an airborne early warning capability, nor do we have an air to air refueling capability embarked. Both of those, frankly, were essential to our operations. Uh, there's uh, a PO liner in the Great Bitter Lakes, uh, reputedly with a large group of Swedish school teachers on board, hence the considerable interest amongst the troops on looking at her. Uh, the Gully Gully Man uh, came ashore at, uh, uh, as we went into the canal, uh, came on board and entertained us with these extraordinary uh, conjuring tricks, producing chickens' ears out of troops' ears, chickens, baby chickens out of troops' ears, and all sorts of things like that. This is really a rather nice picture. We operated for a while in the Mediterranean, and then the Israelis and the Arabs went to war, and uh, we went and scuttled into Grand Harbor Valletta. Uh, and we stayed there for the whole of the Six Day War uh, because there were things in the press which accused the British, the Arabs accused the British of using their carrier borne aircraft uh, to assist the Israelis. Absolute rubbish, of course. HMS Hermes was miles away, somewhere near Sri Lanka, and Victorious was firmly anchored in Grand Harbor Valletta. When the war was over, we all disembarked, all nine of us disembarked and went back to Lossiemouth where I stayed on the squadron for a while. That's rather a nice photograph of one of our aircraft over Nelson's column in late 1967. Fascinating to see uh, the amount of traffic that there was in those days compared to what there is now. Uh, but uh, by early 1968, uh, my two years with the Navy had come to an end and uh, there was a lot of decision-making going on in MOD, which uh, elected to 
give the RAF the Buccaneer instead of the TSR-2. So I went off to the Central Flying School and was taught to become a flying instructor on this little aeroplane, the NAT. I spent a short while uh, instructing at Valley, but I knew that I was going to be sent back to the Navy. And I turned up now as a flying instructor on 736 Naval Air Squadron, uh, flying the Mark II Buccaneer and the ancient Mark I, which had to be pulled out of service from deep storage because for the first two years of Royal Air Force training on the Buccaneer, the Navy offered to do the training uh, because the Air Force was desperate to get the airplane into service quickly and didn't want to form an OCU uh, until they've actually got a first squadron. So I now have to sit in the back of this airplane on the student pilot's first ever flight. Bear in mind, he's flown the Hunter, so we've got a rough idea of what he's like um, as a pilot, and he's flown in the simulator, which frankly was just a systems trainer. It didn't, it was a fixed base simulator that lived in a caravan. It didn't have any motion. It didn't have any visual. And it taught him how to start it and stop it and deal with the odd emergency, but it certainly didn't introduce him to the handling. So for the first ever sortie, I sat in the back and he sat in the front. Here you can see us getting out of one of those first sorties. The chap in the front clearly enjoyed his time. You can see that my grin is a little bit more rictus, probably. At least it was a successful sortie. But basically, you told him what to do or what not to do. Um, it was a high learning curve, that was for sure. And of course, the Mark I Buccaneers that we were using were very old and very tired, particularly their engines. Well, we got through the first... Uh, seven courses of RAF training without too many dramas. And then on the eighth course, I found myself uh, flying with a first tour pilot and uh, we came back into the landing pattern. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, given his level of experience, his first approach didn't go terribly well and we ended up uh, too high crossing the threshold at about 100 feet. So I said, go around again. Uh, he opened up to full power, the left engine stopped working Bear in mind that we've got all this blow coming out. So we're losing thrust significantly. We've got the wheels down, we've got the air brake out. So we're in a high drag situation. The airplane staggers off round the corner uh, and uh, narrowly misses the control tower. And clearly uh, there's no point in staying with it. So I jump out, having told him to jump out, he followed me. The aircraft crashed with a splat on the airfield, skidded across and caught fire. And you can see the fire crew here expending vast quantities of foam to try and put the one serviceable engine that kept going on the right hand side out, which obstinately refused to shut down. They couldn't shut the engine down because in the crash, the cockpit had broken off. And uh, so all the uh, connections from the throttles to the engine had been broken up. I ended up in a, in a heap on the ground, uh, having used the bottom handle, uh, I damaged my back. Uh, the pilot from the front used the top handle. There's my ejection seat. And those two big airbags were the uh, bags that blew up to assist uh, you getting out of the seat if you'd fallen off the aircraft carrier and had to use the underwater escape facility. But they also assisted in pushing you out of the, uh, uh, of the seat once the parachute was deploying. Uh, I knew that I'd got the Martin Baker tie. That was um, a, a given. But the one thing that we really wanted was the solid silver beer mug that uh, Burn Depth Electronics gave you if you had deployed your uh, personal locator beacon to assist in your subsequent rescue. Now, this was clearly designed for the man who'd fallen into the highlands or to the North Sea, miles away from anywhere. Anyway, I'm lying there on the airfield, and my one thought is, I've got to get this PLB out, otherwise I won't get my beer mug. And uh, the rescue services arrived very quickly, and I told them uh, to go away. I did not wish to be rescued, and I used somewhat more powerful language than that, because I wanted to get my PLB out. And they said, don't worry, sir, we understand you're under some stress, but we'll just restrain you from doing yourself any further damage. And sad to say, I never did get the beer mug. But never mind. 
there's rather a nice cartoon which we had because uh, not long after I dejected, we finished the RAF training task uh, with the Navy. And it's a cartoon which uh, one of the cartoonists up there made of those RAF people who had been on loan service to the Navy who had assisted in that first two years of RAF training. And suffice to say, it was a purely uh, joint service operation, which went particularly well. And although we were training RAF people up there, on occasions when our Royal came up to the Moray Firth, we all were allowed to go back and do a bit of deck landing practice. Well, of course, the RAF carried on with the Buccaneer. Here's rather a nice photograph of a 12 Squadron Buccaneer uh, encased in its own condensation cloud. It carried on despite their airships in the MOD not really ever being very keen on it. Uh, and it had a very distinguished career in the Royal Air Force. The only other Air Force in the world to buy the Buccaneer were the South Africans. Here you can see the uh, South African Buccaneers at Lossiemouth about to be deployed out to South Africa. They ordered initially 16 aircraft and they wanted another 16. Uh, but the Wilson government at the day refused to let them have it. Um, the first four flew out uh, as a four ship, but unfortunately they lost one on the way. Uh, and so the subsequent aircraft were brought out by ship and the South Africans operated the Buccaneer very successfully until about 1992. And it took part in many of those uh, local wars down there in South Africa in the 70s, 80s, and perhaps even the early 90s, and they loved it. In the RAF, of course, we deployed the aeroplane into Germany. We used it in the overland role, as well as in the anti-shipping role. Here you can see a couple of 208 Squadron Buccaneers, actually in Scotland. Um, by the end of its life in the Royal Air Force, uh, uh, here's a 237 OCU aircraft uh, right at the end. We were equipped with an ECM jamming pod, which you can see on the uh, wing pylon there. We had the pave spike laser designator bought from America, uh, which was used to great effect in the first Gulf War. We had a self-defense capability with the uh, AIM-9 Sidewinder, both the Golf and Lima versions could be carried. We had a good radar warning receiver in the bullet here of the tailplane. Uh, we did have an inertial platform. It was fairly primitive, uh, but it was essential for use with the Seagull missile. So we did upgrade the Buccaneer, uh, but not as much as it could have been. Uh, there's me achieving 2000 hours on type in the middle 1980s when I was boss of the Buccaneer OCU. Uh, of course, we reckoned we could do anything in the Buccaneer. Uh, and here is a Buccaneer refueling a TriStar, which had been caught short fuel, and uh, we can do anything. Uh, finally, of course, the Gulf War I, where the airplane was deployed out to Bahrain. Uh, it was very successful in designating uh, laser-guided bombs for the tornado force, and indeed, uh, towards the uh, middle and end of the Gulf War I, when the air threat from the Iraqi Air Force had gone away, uh, the Buccaneer was allowed to dispense with its AIM-9 missile, carry its own laser-guided bombs on wing pylons, and designate uh, its own bombs in 40-degree dives uh, onto airfields, hardened aircraft shelters. And indeed, I think it's true to say that the Buccaneer uh, got the only verified Iraqi Air Force kill uh, when it drops a laser-guided bomb on a taxiing AN-2 Cub on an Iraqi airfield, uh, there wasn't much left of the Cub once the bomb had gone off. That aeroplane is now in the Yorkshire Air Museum, and you can see the red uh, Cub painted underneath the cockpit. Well, of course, it all came to an end in 1994, uh, when the aeroplane was finally taken out of service. Uh, it was a wonderful aeroplane. It was particularly good uh, at maritime strike attack. Uh, it was a great aeroplane to fly from the deck, and I was absolutely privileged to be able to do so. So there we are at the end of this presentation. But what I would like to do is just run a short four-minute video clip uh, taken on Ark Royal in the mid-70s, uh, which has got some wonderful Vangelis music with it. And it sort of shows you in four minutes how we operated from the ship against 
the Soviet threat. Mike, how can I get that up? Can you share? 